I'd like to welcome you all to the um, Dover Sherburn Regional School Committee for June 11th, 2020. Um, we're conducting this meeting again remotely via Zoom um, per the governor's order of March 12th, 2020. Due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus, we can uh, comply with our open meeting laws by holding a meeting on Zoom. And so long as we have posted the meeting link as well as the agenda online, which was done on the uh, Dover Sherburn public website for our school system. Um, so anyone who is on here, you've been invited on our Zoom call and anyone is welcome. And so with that being said, we have the same kind of meeting format, but some ground rules since this is remote. We do have public comments at the beginning of the meeting, same as we would in person. Um, the community comments are an opportunity for those members to be heard. And if you could just keep those brief, two to three minutes, and um, then we can move the discussion forward if you wish to contribute newer information, but if it's something that's already been said, um, we can just keep moving to the next person. Also, with regards to the community comments, that's not a dialogue back and forth. It is a time for you to express an opinion or view, and at which time we will then move on to the agenda. And when we go through the agenda, um, anytime there are questions that is reserved for those committee members who are here or those who are presenting, it's no longer a time for the public comment section. As for meeting etiquette, while we're on this call, if you can, if you have a question and you're a committee member or a presenter, if you can raise your hand, you can either do it on the screen, if you get onto the bottom, and you can see that um, there's um, a chat or the reactions, you can do either one, you can click onto those and that'll raise your hand, or you can just physically raise your hand and Don or I should um, acknowledge that you've raised your hand and we will then respond to you. Also, um, when we are voting, since there are three different committees, we will go through each committee. So just remember when it's your committee's time, uh, the committee chair will start. We'll ask you all to take yourselves off of mute, make sure that you say your name and your vote because the person who is taking the minutes, it's harder for them to see um, exactly who is speaking. So if you'll say your name and then your vote, then we can move forward. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order and let's get started with any community comments that anyone may have. Yes, Maggie, you're muted. Maggie, unmute. Hi, Maggie, Sharon, um, speaking as a community member, I, wa I wanted to share um, information that I've received from students um, and alumni of Dover Sherburn High School who um, are planning a rally um, to support racial injustice in the Black Lives Matter movement this Sunday, June 14th at 3 p.m. to convene in Dover Center. They're asking that people uh, respect social distancing expectations and wear masks um, and, and just have asked us to share that information and, and to invite community members to join as well. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Is there anyone else who has any public comment, community comment? Okay. If no one else has any, Don, you didn't see any either. We'll move on then to the reports. Start with Dr. Keough and our superintendent report. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Angie. Um, I know that it says on there that I would um, speak to school start times first, but I actually would like to um, to uh, make a, a comment about the the events uh, in Minneapolis, if that's okay with you, Angie. And uh, yes. Okay, and if it's okay, I think I'm going to read this statement. That's because fine. Because I think it's important. Uh, it needs to be said. Uh, the recent events in our country triggered by the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd have put a magnifying glass on our school system, requiring that we examine more deeply how we actively educate about and fight racism. We have to ask ourselves how often do we use the terms systemic racism in our conversations? What can our students tell us about systemic racism upon graduating from our schools? How do we actively seek to uncover and address examples of institutionalized racism within our school system or communities? Have we made deliberate efforts to deeply examine our curriculum or practices to ensure that our content and messaging is clear and unbiased? Do we respond without rage when we learn about racist behavior within our schools or do we prefer silence? 
How would our students and families of color say we are doing with regard to teaching our students about the true history of racism and exploitation of others by white people? When we teach the age of exploration, which was in fact the complete exploitation of the native peoples of the new world by white Europeans, how do we present this information to our students? The protests seizing the world are the result of centuries of inequalities and injustice against people of color and particularly black people and represent a calling out of the system to demonstrate equal justice for all. The pot has in fact boiled over and the truth is being told. The question is, how will we respond in Dover and in Sherbin? I'm proud of the fact that Dover Sherbin has been focusing on race and cultural awareness in recent years. We have made progress enhancing our curriculum, correcting insensitive practices, and educating our staff and leaders on social injustice using the IDEAS program. I'm also proud of the fact that we're bringing performances to our predominantly white communities that educate about race and living in America as a person of color. Our expansion of the Roots and Wings program is also laudable and is impacting a number of our students. However, we can and should do more. We must engage our families of color and adjust our practices to ensure that equity and excellence, a key core value of ours, remain, remains a priority for our school system. As your superintendent, I'm committing to keeping these topics alive and to uh, more de deliberately making issues of race a priority for this school system. In the coming years, it's my hope that Dover Sherman will become a beacon of anti-racism and that others will look to us as, uh, for guidance when seeking to establish a system that promotes equity and social justice in all realms. I just wanted to make that statement for the record so that it's clear uh, to all of our school committees that uh, I, I believe this is a, this is a carrion call for us. This is a time for us to be much more progressive and to, uh, to not be reactive. And uh, I would expect, hopefully, that you as the school committee will continue to call us on it on a regular basis, that you'll ask how we are um, integrating race into our uh, curriculum, how we are creating opportunities for community members to talk about race, for our, certainly our family members and our students to talk about race, and that, uh, and that you hold us accountable for any uh, response that we have to racial graffiti or anything else. Uh, I would expect that uh, our reactions and responses would be loud and clear. Uh, that's how we are going to uh, turn the corner as a country, and it starts in little communities like ours. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, we've had a lot of work going on in this regard in the past few years, but I want to do much more. So um, that was the first thing I wanted to mention. I don't know if there are any questions on that before I continue, or thoughts. Anybody? Kate? Unmute, Kate. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Keo. I think um, that was really important to say and hear. Um, and I, I completely agree that there's a lot more work to be done. Um, but I, I do think it's important to let the community know, um, our parents and families, about a lot of the things that we've been doing already. Because I feel like in the last couple of weeks, with everything that's coming up, um, people who have been saying, well, what are we doing? And we've been doing so much already. And that's not to say there's, there's certainly more to do. But I think it might be helpful to have the building leaders or administration um, let folks know about Roots and Wings, the conversation at the high school, professional developments we've been doing, um, the work that staff has been doing looking specifically into English and history curriculum and making sure that the books we use are more inclusive. Um, so we, not to underscore, we have a lot to do. I, I absolutely agree, but I am proud of what we've been doing already. And I think a lot of people don't know that. Yeah, I agree, Kate. Uh, Kate and um, that's why I, I tried to kind of make a point of the fact that I am proud of the work that we've done, and we should be proud 
you as the school committee members who, who those of you who were there when we developed the strategic plan know that we made this a priority. You've heard us talk about Mr. Joy. You've heard us talk about um, Mikey Fowlin. You've heard us talk about assemblies that John had in my first year with the entire school with a panel event to talk about race and graffiti in the school. So we have been doing a good job. I think, um, you know, as a resident myself and as a graduate, I think sometimes we miss issues. And I'm not sure that I really want to get into the, in, in depth, but I do think, unless you want me to, but I do think that there are instances where um, we let things go. We make assumptions and we let things go. And I would just give you as an example, um, I'm sorry to say this, this, this uh, is, uh, I think I'm sad, but I have noticed that we do not have as many black students in our honors and AP classes. They are underrepresented in our high level classes. And I think that suggests that somewhere along the line, we, we must be perhaps as an institution, this is what I mean by institutionalized racism, perhaps we are not um, recognizing differences and we could be doing more. So I personally would like to see that as a goal for us. Uh, when we talked to our Boston students last week, they said, you know, we think you should talk about race and, and spend more time educating the kids in Dover and Sherburne about race. And it made me think about in my past experience as a principal where we had a course called African American Studies, which really conquered, I mean, it didn't conquer, but it uh, covered um, racial issues and uh, issues of oppression uh, in, in such a great way. And uh, it, was a, it was a really positive thing and I think it had a big impact on that school. I know Amanda knows um, what I'm referring to. That was a great class. And uh, so I just think as a system, we just have to keep, keep working at it. That's all. I feel like we have an obligation to do that. And I feel good about what we've done, but I think we can do more. This is Nancy. Um, should we, should there be a more formalized task force around this? Or, you know, where, you know, where it's, I, and I don't know, I was trying to think before I was speaking what the, what the kind of objective or like, you know, continuing a discussion, you know, what the objective of the group is, but to kind of make sure that the schools are on course, this community discussion, maybe the task forces, community, school committee members, other people, I don't know, I'm just thinking of it to, to formalize it if the importance is there. I love, I love that idea, Nancy. And but I think, um, honestly, you know, we had a conversation with the leadership team. The ideas course is really all about, um, it's all about these kinds of issues and things that we typically overlook things like white privilege or institutionalized racism. And those take a deeper dive. You really have to, you really have to, to go through the training. When I became principal in Wellesley, they insisted that I take the EMI course. It was mandatory, it wasn't optional. And I don't know if they still do that there, but that made a really strong statement to me that this was a place that was not messing around. If you wanted to be part of their school system, you were expected to take empowering multicultural initiatives. And so many of the teachers and leaders had there. I don't think I can say the same in terms of leaders and even school committee members, frankly. And maybe that's a place to start and then decide whether or not we need a task force. I think if we all took it, I think we would find, yeah, we probably do need to. And that's, uh, go ahead, Amanda. You're, you're muted. No, fin finish your thought and then I'll go. No, no, I was just thinking that might be a, a nice place to start. Um, I was just gonna piggyback on that. I think the ideas course was extraordinary for me as a teacher. And I think if we could get them to do um, even a mini training sort of retreat for us, that would be, that's a fantastic idea. Um, I was also gonna say, also touching on what you said um, that the students asked for, I think it's really important that we start talking about race and doing that explicit education about race 
in kindergarten and do it all the way through because um, we know kids are noticing differences when they're that young. Um, and I was really pleased to see in the Pine Hill um, School Improvement Plan that's in there. Um, already, I know teachers have been thinking about how to better, better integrate race and anti-bias into the curriculum. So, um, so thank you to Pine Hill for that. Michael, oh, sorry, Michael and then Judy. Thank you, uh, Michael Jaffe. Um, thanks for your comments, Andrew. Um, one of the things that, that occurs to me um, when you're talking about the underrepresentation in, in AP and honors classes um, is that uh, it's, it's most probable that scientifically um, all of the Boston students um, are and will continue to be um, next year, um, clinically sleep deprived, which we know goes to the very heart of health, safety, academic performance. Um, I also know that there was a lot of work done um, this year in trying to ameliorate that. Um, and, and there are a lot of creative, creative ideas that were explored and um, a lot of frustration that none of those ideas for, for external reasons um, really weren't practical. A lot having to do with traffic pattern and, and train schedules and safety. Um, I, I would ask um, that we redouble our efforts um, in trying to be creative um, in a number of ways. And I think there are perhaps maybe some things that can be done to try to um, help get our Boston students some more sleep. Judy? I, I just want to, um, I just want to add that whatever we do, I would like, I think it's important um, that we include in sort of leadership and, and include in a fundamental way, the mem those members of our community who are persons of color, okay? It shouldn't be like, I, I hate to say this, but it, I, I, I don't know how to express this, but I think that that's a really important, important thing to do. That's all. Thank you, Judy. Dr. Keogh, is there any, anybody else, or is there anything you'd like to add on this point before you move to your next? Oh, well, on this point, um, no, just that, um, uh, just that I appreciate the outpouring of support, honestly, from all of you and from teachers and family members um, for the work we are committing to doing and, uh, and to our students and former graduates who've written to me as well. Uh, calling us to action. Um, I just, I feel like, I feel very positive about this in a very dark and difficult time. Uh, I just feel like we're headed in the right direction and, um, and we're ready, we're gonna take on this challenge, so. Um, so to put things back in order, I was, we were talking, Michael brought up start times, um, I was slated to give you a presentation tonight about um, the start times. And in looking at our the presentations and the slides that I've been giving you over the course of the year on behalf of the start times task force um, phase two, we really don't have a lot to announce that's new. Uh, on the, you know, in terms of work that was going to be done um, since our April presentation, one of the things that we were going to do was get some training in this uh, in this uh, bus routing software, and Don has in fact been doing that uh, with a few other folks, and um, I'm sure I could tell you about it. But that's a fairly lengthy process. How many hours is that, Don? That you guys have put in so far on that? You're muted. Can't hear you. Don, you were muted. Sorry. Sorry, I never, I, need, I never meet myself. I don't know why I did that. Um, yeah, no, we've we, we've been having uh, two-hour sessions with the vendor, and we have a fabulous um, leader. Uh, so we're working with Conley and uh, staff here. So we're doing it collaboratively, 
and um, we've already uploaded all of our students. We've already uh, advanced them to the next grade. So we're um, starting to learn the tricks of the routing software and uh, we will start plotting out uh, tentative routes um, over the next uh, month or so. Um, sorry. Can I, uh, Judy, go ahead. Have, has it come up at all that the traffic patterns probably will be, have changed dramatically in the fall? Have you thought about that at all? Oh yeah, I think we're gonna have tremendous impact have. on the traffic patterns. So I think we won't see the true traffic patterns until we settle into our new traffic pattern. So um, it could be a little bit of a mess at the beginning, but as you know, once you figure out you're going on a road where it's got school buses going, you're gonna go a different way. So that will take some time to settle out, but we, are, we totally are aware that that's going to be an impact um, around us and then we're traveling at different times to the to the school locations, and that's what we're also um, will be a little bit of a uh, a learning curve for us to see what that impact is going to be. Yeah, I'm just hoping that that many many um, tech companies have and and big companies are having their people uh, work from home all fall, um, or at least, you know, some till September, some till December. Uh, of course, it's, I'm just praying that the traffic patterns in Boston change significantly, that we might be able to do something with the Boston bus, you know? Um, I think those will be temporary though. Um, um, so I think we have to just wait and see. I will say I've noticed a huge uptick in travel just in my commute between here and Medfield recently. Um, right. Oh yeah, I used to travel alone with no cars and now there is a lot of traffic. So I think um, people are out and about a lot more now. Um, but I mean, to that point, who knows what the fall is going to be like. But again, I think we know there's gonna be differences because we have starting points at different times now. Okay. Um, so. I think what was, uh, I'm sorry, I see Amanda's got a question, Angie. Go ahead, Amanda. Um, I just had a question. I guess it bridges start times and reopening. Um, are, is there any talk of scenarios where we would have to have staggered start times because we have to take everyone's temperature and can't absorb all of the students at the same time? And if so, is that another opportunity to stagger our Boston students later, um, if possible? I know that I know there's a lot up in the air, but I know that some there is some talk around about staggering start times in the fall because of COVID concerns? So what I would say to that is um, we just don't know. We, we don't know. And so I, if I could, I would like to just kick that down until I get to the start, uh, the reopening info, because as mm -hmm. far as the start times go, uh, I just really wanted to, first of all, reassure people that the reason that we don't have that much to present to you in terms of changes related to start times is because we've done the work, which was exactly what the Joint School Committee was demanding, insisting upon last year at this time, if you remember, that we get on this and that we get on it fast and that we be thorough. And I really think we have, so I wanna thank, first of all, the Start Times Task Force for their work. And it really started, let's face it, folks, it was Michael Jaffe who was spearheading this thing and he deserves a ton of credit for us being where we are, it was his courage. It's, it, is, it does take courage to stand up to the masses and sit on something controversial and say, we need to do this. And I'm really glad that we went through that process. It was a long process. It, was a, it took a lot of energy from all of us, but I stand by the decision. I hope you do too. And we will encounter challenges. There's no question what Don said is true. It will be messy but we will get through it and we're doing it for the betterment of our, our student body. And so I feel good about that. If I could transition to the reopening, you, you most of you know that we've been having um, conversations with teachers and, and uh, parents. I've seen many of you on those uh, Zoom chats and appreciate your presence there. Uh, it just feels supportive, frankly, to look through the Zoom and see school committee members on the Zoom. Um, and even weighing in on the chats. We have what I think is a really good plan laid out with the reopening task force. 
We have the categories covered. <clears throat> we have good subcommittee leaders. Those subcommittees are targeting people, not targeting, actually targeting is the wrong word. They want to include, be inclusive, more inclusive than we were able to be with the Start Times Task Force and bring people from parents and teachers into these subcommittees. We want to be better with that. Um, but the, uh, the, the problem is this, as I've said so many times, so I won't belabor it, it's such a moving target. And a, a good example would be last week, I believe I was speaking to the chairs and telling them that I'd heard from the commissioner, I was on the Zoom with all the superintendents, that we would get the um, guidance regarding opening um, the beginning of the week on June 15th. Well, yesterday I read something that said in the next two weeks, well, June 15th is Monday. So the next two weeks is not Monday. So that's kind of what happens with all of this. And I had also been, we've been told as a, as a superintendent's association that the guidance that we were going to get regarding reopening would be um, 85 to 95% prescriptive. And by that it meant basically mandated, non-negotiable, this is what you're doing. So I was under the impression from an earlier uh, call um, from the state that we were going to be taking temperatures on the way in. This week we received information about the PPE equipment that we should buy, masks, um, shields for some people who would be working more closely with kids, and no more, um, thermometers because we're not going to be taking temperatures on the way in to your question Amanda okay well that was a bit of a curveball you want to talk about moving the goalposts that's moving the goalposts because I had been having conversations with a company that sells a former graduate who works for a company that sells thermal scanners that takes people's temperatures on the way in it gives you a, a go or a no in terms of uh, body temperature in order to kind of move that process that Amanda was referring to that you know might warrant uh, staggered times. So this is kind of an example of that would have been a forty to fifty thousand dollar ask of equipment and then we find out that no we're not going to do that. So I apologize for all the uncertainty but we just don't know. One of the questions on the parent zoom was well so when will you have the plan ready? That's I mean that's the million dollar question. Um, but hopefully, if it's true, the guidance will be excellent and it will be crystal clear and we won't have to do a heck of a lot of work on the task force, hopefully. But of course, it is always changing and we can't be sure. So um, I'm, I'm very happy with the leadership team and their willingness to engage in this process and take it seriously. I do need to give credit with all of you here to our lead nurse, Jill Fedor who is um, gonna be heading up the Health and Hygiene Committee. She is the ultimate professional. She has been attending Board of Health meetings both sides of the river and has been such a key uh, influence in their conversations in terms of working together and getting answers to our big questions. Because obviously it's not just the state's guidance, we need support from the Board of Health on our decisions too. So there's a lot going on. The plan is, as you know, um, to uh, present to you every two weeks over the course of the summer. And I am telling people, come to those joint school committee meetings so that you can get your updates. The best place to get those updates will be right there. And um, we are intentionally not pulling these committees together until after the, the 4th of July holiday, because we know our people need a rest, myself and Beth and Don and any other of the leaders included. But that is our plan. So um, I don't know, I don't wanna, again, I don't wanna belabor reopening task force, but if you have any questions, I definitely would take them. And on that, so if anybody has any questions now, the only thing is, um, as Dr. Keough says, it's ever changing. Um, the guidance at the state level has been kind of last minute, I feel like on some things. So we've had to adapt quickly. So if there are questions that you have later, I would suggest that you send them on to your chair and um, or send them on to the representative from your committee who is heading up your task, the task force for the reopening, because um, they will have a lot of information 
and and it is it changes every day because the the virus keeps changing. I mean, we don't know it's up, it's down, it's and you know from what I'm saying now it's back up again. I, you know, it's a little disheartening. I just kind of wish we could get to a normal, um, but there's no new normal because the normal keeps changing. The goalposts move every 15 minutes. Yes, Brooke. Um, is there, given how tight the timeline is going to be, and I completely understand about the break, and I think that will actually make people more, or help, hopefully make us more, um, uh, you know, able to process and we'll be a little bit rested. Um, is there any scenario where you would see wanting to employ outside consultants or, um, you know, bring anyone in certain areas of expertise? I know, Beth, you're there. You talked about... Um, I think it's a resident who is an expert in remote learning um, as an example, but just a thought and if we need, you know, to look at the financial implications of something like that. Well, we've, we've never been shy about <laughs> uh, considering consultants and Beth was fortunate enough to find um, this parent who is in fact really a specialist in remote learning. So I do think that is a possibility, uh, Brooke. Um, I think what's important to mention about the prescriptive uh, proposals or guidance that the commissioner will be sending, the reason he's doing that is so that we won't all be going in different directions because that creates a real, real mess. So if we had a consultant who said, no, don't do what everyone else is doing, do this, that would actually be money that was not really well spent because the expectation and the pressure from the commissioner and the state will be to follow their guidance. So I think what we're really asking people to do is just hang in there, let's get the guidance and then let's decide how much control we have and how much we don't. And if we it wasn't my intention that they would uh, upend our, the plan, whatever it is, just, just to, to make our lives easier if it's possible in, in any way. Definitely, and, we, and we, you guys have always been great about that, so we will definitely do that if need be. And, We've had amazing volunteers in the community who've also offered all sorts of services. So great, I'm great. Happy with that, so. Anne, did you have something? Anne? Um, yeah, I did. Thanks, Angie. It's Anne Hubby. Um, I just wanted to say to people um, who are not members of the school committee, so members of the public, that you can always also reach out to members of your of your school committees to share your thoughts. If you're, if you have connections or ideas, um, we are all willing and ready to listen. Um, so we can be your conduit to the committees, even if we are not on it ourselves, then we can pass it on to our representatives. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Ann. I so, just had one, yes, sorry, I just had one question too. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions from community members about this, obviously about the fall. And I think a lot of people are feeling, um, obviously they want their kids to go back to school, but I think they're also just feeling like we're hoping, they're hoping school will be able to resume as in, with as much normalcy as possible. And one question folks are asking me is how much autonomy do we as a district have to make our own decisions or how closely do we need to adhere to guidance from the state or from the CDC? So it's a good question, Megan. And, um, and that one's come up on the parent um, conversations quite a bit. I mean, you, I guess all I can say is that in, in that Zoom meeting, he, the commissioner was really clear that it would be 85 to 95% prescriptive, meaning you don't get to choose. That said, he left the door open that if you wanted to appeal to go outside of their parameters, that's still a possibility. So that door has not been slammed shut. Um, that's why it's so it's so important that we first let's let's find out. Uh, I've I've been saying this a lot ad nauseum, quite frankly, but we're trying to avoid going down rabbit holes of speculation yep. because it's exhausting, honestly. Because why why expend all that energy that could be com completely dashed on the rocks with his guidance? So, but yes, I think that there are options for us um, if we totally disagree with what they're recommending. Okay. Or we have a better idea. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. So next on the agenda, if we're, um, if there's nothing else with regards to the reopening, Dr. Keo. Yeah, no, I, you know, the, the other comments on there, I think folks can read and 
Um, they don't need any, um, unless they have questions on it. I don't need to go through any of that. So yes, you can move on. So next is the assistant superintendent's report. Um, thank you. So I'll be brief. Um, as I mentioned, our memorandum of understanding team for the supervision and evaluation process has had our, we've had our first two meetings um, virtually, of course. I want to thank Maggie and Amanda and Mark for serving on that committee. And I know that our teachers are so pleased where they absolutely love all of you, but having three educators at the table with them, I know, um, who live through the evaluation process, uh, they're extra pleased about. So thank you. Um, and we have our to-do list, our task list, you know, a tentative timeline for next year, obviously uh, giving ourselves some time to settle into whatever September and October look like um, and then move forward. So um, that's all I'll say on that, unless there's somebody else who would like to speak and comment. Maggie? Maggie? I just wanted to take a minute to say thank you to Beth for organizing um, this particular memorandum of understanding group. I think that um, just thinking about the focus on being able to create and adapt for Dover and Sherburn's needs, a substantive, thoughtful, reflective process is so evident in the work that you've done to set, set us up. And, um, you know, we all have had the experience of attending lots of, of Zoom and real life meetings. And um, I do have to say that the sessions that we spent that you organized were particularly effective. I walked out of, of both of those meetings feeling like, hey, we did some real work and had real conversations. And um, I am impressed with the degree to which all of our educators are committed to, to making and creating a thoughtful process that will help the whole district move forward um, in terms of strong teaching and learning. So thank you. Thank you for saying that. Andrew, um, I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't realize you were still on that. Go ahead, Beth. No, I'm just going to go on to another topic, but you're welcome to speak. No, I, I wanted to say something when you were done. Oh, okay. No um, thank you. And thank you, Maggie. Um, so in terms of the cultural responsiveness piece, I think that Andrew, everything he said so articulately, um, I agree with wholeheartedly. We have done a lot of work. Thank you, Kate. Um, I know even just in the last week, my own children have been, you know, reading books and having conversations with their teachers in Dover, Sherburn. So I really want to commend our educators on top of being exhausted um, for taking a risk. Um, some of them have never taken the risk to have a difficult conversation yet, um, you know, during their time as a teacher. And, and they did. And uh, many of them wrote to us saying, thank you for pushing us. It was so well worth it. And the kids were truly engaged. So um, thank you for our teachers there. That being said, this is, this is a, still a work in progress, but I do want to mention it that, um, and it relates to my third topic, which is having collected a lot of information from the teachers, I, individu I individually interviewed 25 of them, K through 12, the ones who have really figured out remote learning um, extensively. Um, but looking at all the data from the teachers and from the students and from the parents, one of the things that keeps coming up about remote learning is that when there's opportunities for kids to do kind of interdisciplinary things that involve hands-on products, collaboration, that the kids seem more engaged. So our teachers themselves brought up the fact at both the elementary and the middle school level, the fact that they want to try to focus their um, fall curriculum um, around interdisciplinary units. And so we are providing workshop days this summer for them to do that. And I know Ana is here as a, um, a guest member in the audience, but um, she's part of that group. Um, and we also have um, the assistant principals from the elementary schools and our reading specialist part of this. Um, it's really exciting. And in terms of making the thematic units meaningful, this will be one unit towards perhaps many more to come at each grade level. Um, we needed to kind of figure out, well, what is the topic? What is the theme gonna be? How do they fit together? You know, looking at schools like Charles River where each grade has a question, we thought we would adopt that model. Um, and so, even you know before the tragic events of the last couple of weeks, we had talked about using the teaching tolerance standards for social justice as our framework because they have a framework for every grade level and using those indicators for our questions. So our thematic units pre-K through two are gonna be about identity because we know kiddos at that age, it's all about them. They are the center of their universe. Um, three through five will be diversity. Six through eight um, will be um, justice. And then nine through 12 will be action. 
um, and we'll be using the indicators and threading those through throughout the year. And the goal is that, you know, obviously we'll be teaching math and science and social studies, um, but you'll see connections to those standards throughout the year. And then if the kids walk away with nothing else at the end of any grade level, they'll know what their, their theme was for the year and they'll, they'll have that sentence memorized by heart. So that's exciting. Um, and I think that's all I had for today, but I'm happy to take questions or comments. Rob, I just wanted to commend you for once again, finding a silver lining in all of this and moving us forward um, and embracing this a, a, as an opportunity and all the hard work and thinking that goes into that. So it just, it seems to happen regularly. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, it's a team effort. The, the teachers are really amazing. And, um, you know, looking at the, the survey results that they submitted not only helped us identify best practices, but I made them put something they're proud of so I can hand them that paper again in, in September when they, they're starting off again about something they walked away with this year. But a lot of them talked about how proud they were of collaborating with their colleagues. You know, we had a lot of um, teams who split up and said, you know, I'm going to take social studies, you take math. And then the kids got to know all four fifth grade teachers, et cetera. They're excited about technology and forcing themselves out of the box to try new things. Um, and they were also excited about taking the curriculum and saying what's really important, what really matters um, in all of this. So they are, they're, they're amazing and they help it all happen. So thank you. I, I, I think um, Beth, you do not give yourself enough credit. And um, if you look carefully at what uh, Beth has done as our uh, assistant principal for curriculum and instruction, she has connected the dots. The, the work that we've been doing connects so well with what we have to do now in this strange circumstance because, because she's ahead of the curve. And to that end, I just, I, I feel as if I should share Beth with the school committee, your, um, the piece that you sent out to the faculty today to talk about, it was a, again, one of those screencastifies that your voice was laid over this presentation, but they could see where we're going as a school system over the course of the summer as we prepare for the uncertainties of next year. It was so, so nicely done and I, I would like to share that with all of you and I will. I'll put that in an email to folks. It's, it's excellent and I know that you'll feel, if you were a teacher, you'd feel so much more confident knowing that somebody's thinking about these things. So um, we're trying to take pressure off of our teachers. They're under a tremendous amount of strain and if we can make things simplified, if we can break things down and make it easier for them, um, where and and it's still productive at the same time. That's a twofer, and that's what we're trying to do. And Beth, you do that so well. So I will send that out to folks, and you'll be able to see it for yourself. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else, Beth? No. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. So, um, any other questions, everybody? Good. The next, we're going to move on to Dr. Keo, which is your superintendent goals. Thank you. Um, so um, I, I, I put the watermark on there for a reason. It's a draft, um, but uh, and I also tried to streamline it as much as possible so as not to write a book on this um, content. Uh, this is something that I talked through with the chairs about how to present this, but you can see I have five goals laid out. Um, the uh, top four are uh, district improvement goals, and then there is a student learning goal. Um, we, I, my first goal is obviously to prepare for the transition to the new start times. This is something that we've been working on for well over a year now, and um, I'd like to be sure that it is done right. We want to make sure that the um, the transition is as smooth as possible, that our transportation issues are worked out, and that we are assessing um, the impact of the change on all of our students. Uh, we know that people are concerned about the change uh, for our younger students. We want, to, we want to, to do the best job we can assessing how this is impacting our students. Just because we're changing the start times, uh, doesn't mean it's etched in stone for the next 50 years. That's not the kind of school system we are. 
we want to make sure that it's working and that in fact it is good for our students so and if there are adjustments that need to be made down the road we want to be able to do that but we want to be able to do that based on the evidence that we have so it will be important as we go through this process that we survey and look at the data uh, that comes in regarding discipline uh, achievement uh, attendance tardiness all of those things can easily be tracked and we will pay attention to that so that's that's obviously one of my key goals um, who knew that i would have uh, another key goal uh, related to responding to a pandemic uh, but obviously this has become uh, talk about having to swivel and this has become uh, hugely important for us obviously we want to make sure that our, uh, that our students receive a quality education regardless of the disruptions. We want it to be a meaningful, worthwhile experience for them, and we want it to be done right. So we're going to pour the energy in. Uh, that's going to be an ongoing thing. I hate to say it, but um, according to projections, this thing could be around for a while. Um, but. I think as each month goes by, we learn more. Uh, the scientists learn more about, you know, who's who's most contagious, who's more most likely to be um, affected by it, and this will impact how we move forward. But I, I wanted to be sure that um, this became a, a priority for me, and obviously the reopening task force and that that work that we'll be doing is critical. Uh, the third goal is. Um, ensuring that the portrait of a graduate work that's been done, uh, the innovation committee leading to this portrait of a graduate is hugely important and I, we don't wanna let this go. Uh, we had a busy year and we weren't able to uh, move it forward uh, uh, to the extent that we wanted to, but I do believe this is something we can do next year, so that's um, a priority. Uh, the uh, communications task force, the communications task force is one of those things that unfortunately I, uh, I fully admit has has suffered uh, in terms of my time uh, commitment but one of the things that we were able to do and I appreciate the, the work of the members of the task force one of the things that we were able to do is really hone in on the fact that our, our website needs to be upgraded and we want to get that done right and so that uh, is a priority for me next year and then uh, finally, I want to obviously continue to work with Beth to ensure that we don't lose sight of the fact that uh, reviewing our curriculum on cycle is a critically important piece of, of what we do as a school system. Not every school system does that. In fact, very few do. It's really, really important that we do that and that we keep our curriculum alive and um, current. And so when we talk about things like infusing issues of race into our curriculum, that's how it happens. When Beth works with the teachers and gets really deep into the weeds on the curriculum and what it is we want our kids to know or be able to do, that's where those conversations take place. So it's important that it be a goal. And I, uh, and I mentioned uh, in there uh, the importance of, of keeping race a priority and um, that was not in there in the past. It needs to be. So, you know, that's the whole point of having goals, right? You have to adjust, be nimble. And um, so we're going to refocus a little bit there. And then the last, sorry about the numbering, the goal number six is, uh, is obviously an ongoing kind of my own professional practice because there has to be a professional practice goal, which is to continue to work with the supers that um, that I have uh, come to know who are part of my job alike group and who are part of the Tri-Valley, uh, Tri-County uh, Superintendents Association. And um, uh, I just have a, a strong group of, of colleagues who I rely on and can trust and we provide great support. So I want to continue with that, attend conferences where I can if time allows and uh, continue my work with uh, my consultant slash coach, Matt King, who has just been uh, invaluable. And I appreciate the fact that the school committee has uh, committed to that for me. So, and that is, uh, those are my goals. And I know I did not get into the specific uh, details as I, I have, 
uh, in the past, but given the uh, kind of uh, pressures of the year, um, I'm happy to do that. Uh, obviously, anytime you write goals, people want to know how we're going to know you've achieved them, and that um, that's obviously an important piece, but I think you will see the evidence. Does anyone have any questions? Henry. Uh, thank you. I just, I just want to quickly point out uh, one thing I really appreciate, appreciate about these goals, Dr. Keogh, and it has a little bit to do with how we did your evaluation, whatever, last meeting or the meeting before. Um, what I like about these is they're very clear and actionable in the short term, meaning um, the first two really address something that is in front of us today and will be in front of us for the, you know, the next handful of months. Um, and I think the way you've set them up is really done well, where it's going to really improve our district next year, improve our district going forward. And I really like that you kind of kept it simple. So I, I think in previous years, there's been all these sub bullets and there's been other things to look at. And I appreciate the way you aligned everything for this particular cycle. Thanks, Henry. Is there anyone else who would like to um, comment or ask a question? I have a question in general. Is there a goal anywhere, whether it's a superintendent goal or anything else that, that speaks to um, diversifying the educator population at DS? Um, I don't know if there is, Lynn, and uh, there is, I, I, I would have to go back and look at our specifics under the um, cultural awareness. I have a feeling that in our action plan, we do in fact mention that. Beth, do you recall? I believe, I believe it might be, but whether it's formally written or not, it's been something we've been talking about, talking about in the, yeah. for the last three years. And I know that we've, some of us have been attending job fairs and some of us are starting to think about developing pipelines with local universities and you know, Framingham State is right down the street. Um, so it's been on our minds and I know, um, you know, Allison Gullingsford particularly is very passionate about it. So she might be a good leader to keep us moving forward. But the, it's, it's a hugely important point, Lynn, and um, it did come up in our leadership team meeting, I think maybe even in the last two meetings, because I'm uh, being a little pushy, I'm, I'm, I have to admit, and uh, being a little more deliberate in saying that, okay, we talk about this, but talk is cheap, and we need to do better. Um, we have done some pretty creative things uh, actually to, um, to bring in people of color and actually people of color from Boston. So some of you, probably most of you don't know this, but um, we obviously are always looking for teaching assistants and um, we had the opportunity to hire um, a person from Boston, but she didn't have a car. And so she rode with the kids. And we checked in with the Boston parents, and she has worked out well. And I believe that led to another person also riding the bus. So, you know, that would have been a very easy thing for us to say, no, 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 no. That's too complicated. And we could have just killed it instantly. So I think the spirit is there, but I think we do definitely need to be more deliberate. And I think um, uh, that's on us to potentially, you know, I could adjust. I could adjust one of these goals to specifically say it, um, but we also are due to uh, uh, revise the strategic plan soon, and that's another place where all of these things need to be specifically documented. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Makes sense. Thanks. I, I think Lynn brings up a good point, and you know, an area where we can focus is really around the educational assistance. I think we see a, a lot more turn in that particular segment of our education or educator base. Um, so if there's a pipeline that uh, Beth kind of alluded to with local schools, a program we can be involved in, internships or whatever, um, to help encourage that type of activity to get the pipeline, to get the educational assistance in, that ultimately, um, if the opportunity is there to become a professional status teacher, it would be outstanding. So Lynn brings up a very, very good point. It's, it's all sorts of diversity too, right? There's um, economic diversity, there's diversity across the table that doesn't just, you know, illustrate itself based on the skin color. So it's something for us to always think about. Yeah. Kate, Potter? Um, yeah, I agree with all your thoughts about um, 
seeking out more teachers of color and um, working on those pipelines are all great ideas. And I, I had an interesting conversation with Monique Marshall Veal the other day about also making sure that DS is a place that is appealing to a teacher of color and that they would want to come and work and be welcomed and valued. Um, so that's just another thing that we wanna make sure we're on top of too. And one of the things that is not attractive is that we're predominantly a white staff. And that's a heavy burden to, you know, our, our, our people of color carry a heavy burden and that's been expressed, even the kids have expressed it to us, that they don't want to always be the person who has to talk about race. Yeah. You know, it's really hard for them. And the same holds true for teachers. If we only have a handful, it makes it really difficult for them. So I think we need to just be as deliberate as we can and, bro and broaden our, uh, our scope. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything? Thank you, Doctor. Oh, uh, Mark. Sorry. I'm sorry. One, one quick note. Sorry, Beth. Thanks. Oh. On that point, um, and on the planning for the fall, uh, I think that could relate to goal five, uh, Doctor Keo, or goal six, I guess, where you're expanding connections with the superintendent network in this area. Because I can say that Needham has that same focus of wanting to diversify our teaching staff. And we've been through job hiring fairs. Um, we have a human resources manager who's, who just recently formally challenged us to um, pull in a candidate of color to our hiring pools whenever possible to at least get the experience and exposure, be able to talk about Needham and to demonstrate you know, actions where we are actively trying to diversify. Um, some other suggestions that we've had in Needham may be applicable to Dover Sherborne. And I think just collaborating um, on that superintendent level can help surface some ideas that one town may not be thinking about and the other one can benefit from. Um, to, to that end, uh, to that uh, point, Mark, which I really appreciate, you know, we've had candidates of color come out for interviews, actually for some pretty high level positions, and they didn't take it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder sometimes if they look at our population and say, it's just so incredibly white here yeah. that I don't know if it's going to be comfortable for me. And um, that's not, and that's not, I don't think, intended to be an insult. And I don't think it makes us bad people that that's our makeup. But I, I do think that we perhaps should think about, at some point, um, about our, our numbers of uh, Boston students that we allow. We have been working with a number of 40 for I think since the beginning. And I'm not suggesting right now that you, I'm not suggesting somebody make a motion to change that uh, at this moment, but maybe that's something as a system we would want to think about at some point. You know, Dr. Keo, on that point, I was, um, I, I was getting my youngest a haircut the other day and of course I had to stand outside. And so there was a young man sitting on the bench and we were talking, screaming through our masks and he, went to Natick and he expressed that they have, you know, quite a bit of Metco students. It seems like they have more than we do. And I was wondering that same thing about, you know, increasing numbers or what that would look like or how our district could maybe expand. Well, so. we're small, we're smaller certainly than Natick. Right. But it is something to think about. Yeah. So I put that out there as a reflective question. And just really quickly, um, and you alluded to this, Dr. Keo, but um, a lot of things that we're talking about are longer term goals. And so while what you, we were specifically talking about were your goals, Andrew, for next year, so many of them will continue on or will continue to expand. Um, so I think that right now for us to feel like we need to solve everything all at once, probably is, it's good for us to remember that we don't need to solve everything right now. And in fact, building a really strong base to then continue to pursue is probably the way to go, which is what you're doing with the goals that you set out. T totally agree. And when you go through the strategic planning, when we go through the strategic planning process again, that's when we say, okay, how are we doing with this and what needs to stay and what needs to go and where should we um, refocus? So good point, Ann. Well, if that's all on um, the superintendent goals, thank you, Dr. Keogh, for always um, keeping us on our toes. And thank you, everyone, for contributing <laughs> to our conversations each time. Now we're going to move to the bargaining unit contracts. Um, with that, Don, if you'll Update us. 
Yes, thank you. Um, we're pleased tonight to have uh, two of our four bargaining units um, um, at, at a point where they're in agreement with what we're bringing to you tonight to be approved. Uh, the first one is the administrative assistance. In your memo, I try to put perspective um, around these bargaining units so you, you have an um, idea of how many employees that we are talking and the ramifications of any benefit changes that we're talking about with, with me. So for our admin assist, um, between our 12 month and our 10 month positions, we currently have 16 um, individuals or employees across all three districts. Um, they came to the table uh, mainly with um, very few new requests. Um, obviously in all these contract negotiations, salary turns out to be the most important uh, piece for the majority of um, the units, but they were looking for um, additional bereavement leave around uh, who you could take bereavement for and how many days. So we're trying to actually be consistent across all of our employee units. So you'll recognize this language because we actually just extracted it from our educator agreement. And um, uh, that's by using this language, it addressed all the requests that they had. So that, that's the first uh, article you see. And remember, what we bring forward to you for approval are just the changes we're making to the already existing contract, which hopefully I think Ann made sure you were provided with that, I think uh, a couple of months ago, um, so that you could just look at the, the whole uh, contract and put this in perspective. Um, the second um, category was, or the issue was longevity benefits. They had come to us wanting steps. So if you think about the matrix that we have for the educators, they were looking for something like that. So not only would you get a COLA increase as you spent longer um, time here, but you'd also get another increase. Um, we sort of solved that request by adding a new uh, category for longevity. So we, um, at, this, at the old contract, you did not receive any longevity until you've been with us for 10 years. We added a five year category. So in a way, if you take that longevity payment and extrapolate it over the year, they are getting a per hour um, increase uh, on an annual basis. It's just being given to them on a longevity payment versus um, steps on a matrix. Um, given that we only have small numbers of people in these units, uh, it serves two purposes. One, it is uh, it's much easier to administer from a payroll standpoint, um, not to have a big matrix for only 16 people. Um, and uh, longevity then just sort of shows that we do, uh, we do uh, appreciate how long um, these individuals stay working for us. Uh, so in addition to adding the five years, you can see in the old contract that um, over each year, we gave them an increase in longevity. When we did this contract three years ago, they were definitely well below our comparative districts. So we tried to phase in at least getting them closer over the three years. Um, now we're bringing them up a little higher, but we feel like we are where we need to be, so we are not looking at giving increases each year, but, liter but we are living it at, um, over the next three years, those will be the longevity amounts per category. And then of course, um, the wage schedule. We have a starting range for our admin assist in the old contract of $20 to $23. Um, we have found in one or two hires recently that that $20 is really placing us out of the market. Um, we think the 23 is actually not um, a, a bad place for starting. So we're just increasing that range at the bottom level to 21, but we're keeping the top range at 23. So when you join us, you will come in um, somewhere between the 21 and $23 range per hour. Given that then um, for the people who already work for us, the COLA that we have um, agreed upon is two and a quarter for year one and 2% for the next uh, two and three years. And I think it'd be easier if we just take these by units. So does anyone have any questions on the administrative assistant? I have a quick question. Is the, the salary ranges, are they, 
how do they compare to the market? Yeah, so we are for starting ranges and looking at um, other districts who, who potentially have small steps, we're in a really good um, position for where you would enter into surrounding school districts. So I will just give you, just so if you, the longer you stay here, obviously, so we do have some administrative assistance, just so you think everyone makes 21 to 23 dollars, like in the 27 dollar um, range. So when you come in, you come in at your base and then every year you stay here, you're gonna get your COLA. So that number continues to build. So the 21 and $23 is just someone new entering into um, our districts. Okay. All right, thanks. I know, I think that adds better perspective um, that people, that's the entry level. Okay. Is there anyone else with a question with regards to the administrative assistance? Okay. Do you want to move to the next one and see if there's any with food service? Well, why don't we just, do you want to go ahead and just make a um, uh, vote on the, and then, yeah. And yes. we're doing it by group. Yes. But let's start with Dover. All right. Um, do I have a motion uh, to accept the changes to the, um, for the tentative agreement between the Dover Sherman School, uh, regional school committees, and the Admin Assistant Association, um, as presented by Don in our packet? Uh, please take yourself off mute and do I have a motion? Leslie yeah. Leon, I move the motion. Do, do I have a second? Mark Healy, I second. Uh, any discussion? All right, uh, again, roll call, say your name and then your vote, Leslie? Uh, Leslie Leon, yes. Mark? Mark Healy, yes. Brooke? Matt Reese, yes. And Henry Spaulding, yes. And why don't you go, go ahead? All right. Um, same motion for the regional school committee. Do I hear a motion, please? Lynn Collins, so moved. Thank you, Lynn. Second. Maggie Sharon, second. Thanks, Maggie. Discussion? No. We'll do a vote. Judy. Judy Miller, yes. Lynn. Lynn Collins, yes. Kate. Kate Potter, yes. Michael? Michael Vietti, yes. Maggie? Maggie Sharon, yes. And Ann Hubby, yes. Okay, Sherburn School Committee, there's only three of us. One had to step away, had something come up. So do I have a motion to accept the um, contract, contract as presented between the Administrative Assistance and the Dover Sherburn Regional School Committees? Um, do I have a motion? Uh, Amanda Brown, so moved. Second. Megan Page, second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Amanda? Amanda Brown, yes. Megan? Megan Page, yes. And Angie Johnson, yes. Thank you. Um, they will we'll let them know tomorrow. And then um, chairs, Henry, those, because you're, you are approving all these as chair, you'll get to come in and do all the signing. So we'll get to see you one more time. I like field trips. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it, just to put it in perspective, so the administrative assistant was completely all done on Zoom. Um, uh, so that was um, definitely interesting to be, you know, negotiating with the four of us on our little Zoom. The next one that we're presenting, food service, we actually pretty much completed live. So they we were all crammed in Andrew's office, I think about six of us. Um, so we had two different perspectives of uh, negotiating here but we're pleased tonight to bring forward to you the contract for the next three years for our food service group. And as I set the parameters around this for you, um, we have about 15 really um, uh, regular employees across all three of our school districts in, in this particular uh, contract. Uh, the biggest piece here was that we were clearly below, a little bit below market, but also as uh, the world has changed, we were um, actually had to have a pay increase for one of our categories in January because the minimum wage went up and it was, it was more than what was the $12 that was in the contract for uh, substitutes. So this one, we really had to sit back and look at where minimum wage was going. Um, and as you know, by uh, January of 2023, minimum wage in Massachusetts is going to be up to $15. 
So if you increase your entry level positions in the food service up to minimum wage, you also have to make um, adjustments to everyone who works above that. So you will see in this contract, um, the biggest um, issue we had was on the, the wages. And um, I'll get to that in, in just a second, but I will say that was their, um, our biggest challenge there. For sick leave, um, they wanted and they requested 13 days. Again, that is being consistent with our other 10 month um, employee con employment contract. So we um, were in agreement to bring them up to 13 days um, over the 10 month school year. And in the same um, vein, as we talked about with the admin assist, they also came in with a matrix of steps. And in lieu of doing that, we've included on their contract a new um, longevity category starting at the three years of service. Um, their existing longevities actually were um, in line with the uh, area districts, so all we didn't have to adjust those. So by just adding the one category, we felt like we addressed their request for um, steps. Um, the food service um, employees currently receive an annual allowance of $225 to um, purchase clothing for work. As you know, um, going in and out of kitchens um, is, is tough on your clothes. So we do um, give them that allowance. Uh, in, in, um, in, the, um, what I mean, in the spirit of really wanting to be team players and really representing uh, Dover Sherburn to the best of their ability, they have requested that we actually um, provide uniforms so they feel like they have DS spirit and there is a consistent look um, in this in the cafeterias which I commend them for I, I think that was um, showing their commitment to us and how they want to um, the, the way they want to present themselves so we have agreed to purchase for our full-time employees five shirts and two visors on an annual basis this is in addition to the $225 clothing allowance that they'll have available to purchase pants and shoes um, because you know standing on your feet um, all day they do um, they do purchase appropriate shoes um, and then we'll do um, uh, a prorated uh, uniform set for our part-time employees uh, so they were working with Janelle actually to come up with uh, the style the logo so it was actually I think an exciting um, thing for them to work on and, and again I commend um, their desire to want to uh, present DS in the best light and feel like they're part of our team. Mm -hmm. So moving on to the um, wage adjustments. So if you compare these amounts to the contract that you had before, we're re completely replacing uh, the attachment three. And a little bit of a different change we did here too is that for these ranges you're seeing, they're just the starting rates. So these are not taking into effect into account people who've been here for a long time and be maybe making more. It didn't make sense um, from our perspective to continue to have those ranges because we could have some people that have been here 20, 30 years and that one person makes the range look a little um, a, a little out of whack. So we, you will see that for now it just says positions. Really, these are just the starting rates. And we gave ourselves, with Janelle's input, um, some latitude to hire people with no experience or experience. So that's what you would see with the differences in the, um, in the ranges. So we basically took the existing starting range for all these positions and added a dollar on year fiscal year 21. To that then in fiscal year 22, we took the base range, the starting point and added the 75 cents. And then in 23, we did the same. So everything we did was based on where we are now and then doing those increases, um, not of the COLA, but just as the base increase over the next three years. Um, and I will say that um, again, I, we consulted with Janelle on all this because obviously um, with her job alike, she sort of knows what's going on. And with their feedback, we really feel like we're positioned well, that Janelle um, and her group would never be um, not able to hire someone if they're willing, if they wanna hire them because they can get um, a higher salary someplace else. So I think we've made ourselves very competitive now. And uh, also I think we're bringing up this employment group to, to be more in line with some of our other 
employee groups. Um, so I, I, we feel really good about this. And although it seems like it's a lot of money, it's really only, again, 15 people. They work anywhere from 1,000 to 12,000 hours, 1,000, sorry, 1,100 to 1,200 um, hours a year. So we're talking in total, like all of this is like $18,000. So that, that helps you put it in perspective that may help because you see all these dollars and 75 cents is 75 cents being added and, and it does make um, make you a little nervous that we're selling we're selling uh, the, the school for uh, food service. I will also say that um, over the last probably um, six, uh, four to six years, we have really streamlined our operations on food service. So they actually are all, as you know, carrying positive fund balances. Um, in, in their um, revolving funds, because remember these are self-funded operations. So this is not money that we're asking the towns for. These are all funded by the lunch revenues and the government uh, subsidies that we get. Um, and that we have been running positive uh, fund balances. In fact, although we kept everyone on payroll through this pandemic, um, we are covering it all with monies that they had already um, um, uh, built up in their fund balances. So I think we're not doing anything that would jeopardize um, the operations of uh, the food service. I will say we may go to um, bringing, uh, we may bring food lunch pricing increases to you next year versus waiting an additional year just because we're trying to keep pace with minimum wage. So I bore you all to death. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie, do you have a question? I, I do. I, I think you answered it, but it looks to me like you have said that even with the increases in this contract, we are still uh, paying for the cost of our food service employees by the food that we sell. Exactly. Okay. So, I, I mean, I, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer here, but will we be revisiting this whole service operation if it in fact appears we will have difficulty feeding people with food service come September? Yes. Oh, yes, okay. we will. Yes, that will be one um, until we know what we're up against. Um, but definitely, we, Janelle and I have already been talking about uh, and what that may look like um, come the fall under a couple of different scenarios. Uh, so I think she's um, she and her group have had time to, uh, some of the creative ideas, I will have to say, um, they, they spend a lot of time because they actually have it right now to do it. But I, I think she's gonna be creative in that she can hopefully maintain her staff but, and also serve the students uh, um, the same level of lunches that we have um, under the old conditions, under the new conditions. Okay. Brooke. Wait, sorry, I'm coming back. <laughs> sorry. Um, this is a, it might be too early to tell question too, but um, we had talked about breakfast options or some kind of breakfast um, mm -hmm. food for the elementary kiddos. Is this a place where you could update us on the status of that and the impact that that may or may not have on this? Yeah, so we were, um, up until the pandemic, we still planned on running a pilot um, breakfast program at both elementaries. Uh, so, but I, it depends on what the restrictions are going to be, um, for operations come the fall. But as you know, uh, she uh, wrote a grant received, uh, and actually received it for a smoothie machine. Um, and then we were going that we, at one of the districts and we were going to duplicate, um, purchasing another one so that we had equal equipment at both schools and it was going to be grab and go, uh, breakfast that we definitely were going to do, um, as a pilot for next year. We didn't have an overwhelming um, uh, yes for the, from the parent survey. It was more of the 50-50 split, but we still okay. wanted to give it a try because um, why not? It, it made sense and it, it, it actually, I think, addressed some of the parents' concerns, but I don't know what our limitations are gonna be um, in this particular coming year. Okay. Okay, so t TBD then. Yes. Okay, thank you. Anybody else with any questions? Okay, so with that, Henry, do you wanna start us again in Dover? Sure. Uh, with Dover, take yourself off mute. Um, do I have a motion to accept the uh, changes in the agreement with the Dover, Sherburn, and Dover, Sherburn Regional School? 
uh, committees in our Food Service Administration staff uh, for July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2023. Do I have a motion? Yeah, Mark Healy, so moved. Thank you, second, do I have a second? Leslie Leon, second. Thank you, Leslie. Any discussion? Uh, with none, I will do a roll call for your vote. Uh, Leslie. Leslie Leon, yes. Mark. Mark Healy, yes. Brooke. Brooke Matteris, yes. And Henry Spaulding is a yes. Can I hear the um, motion for the same wording as Henry just did? Maggie Sharon, so moved. Thank you, Maggie. Are you a second? Kate Potter, second. Thanks, Kate. Discussion? Hearing none, go for a vote. Maggie? Maggie Sharon, yes. Michael? Michael Jaffe, yes. Thank you, Don. Lynn? Lynn Collins, yes. Kate? Kate Potter, yes. Go ahead, everybody. One, two, three, four, five. And Ann Hubby, yes. Great. Oh, sorry, Judy. I was Judy. thinking that was short. <laughs> down the, you're down my bottom screen. Um, Judy Miller. Judy Miller, yes. It, thanks. Okay, so Sherburn, take yourself off of mute. Do I have um, someone to bring a motion forward to accept the new contracts as provided for the food services um, for FY21 through FY23? Megan Page, so moved. Do I have a second? Amanda Brown, second. Any discussion? Seeing that there's no discussion, um, I'll call for a vote. Megan? Megan Page, yes. Amanda? Amanda Brown, yes. And Angie Johnson, yes. And thank you, Don, for making all those numbers seem flawless. Thank you. So we do have two remaining uh, uh, contract uh, groups um, that we're currently in process with. Um, we, we got slowed down a little bit uh, with uh, these meetings coming up this week and some other hot issues, but uh, hopefully because you have meetings scheduled from now throughout the summer, uh, when you do have a meeting and we have a contract ready, we will be bringing it forward uh, to you at that meeting. So as soon as we get, uh, we could even have another one at your June um, joint meeting. So stay tuned on those and uh, we're gonna continue to work it on our end. Anne, did you have something? I was just gonna ask about the yeah. two remaining right. units. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Don. <laughs> yes, that COVID impacted all our negotiations because everything kind of came to a halt yeah. a little bit. Um, so finally, we're moving on to the consent agenda to approve the May 18th, 2020 minutes. Is there any changes or um, allowances that need to be made that you saw in reading the minutes? I did not, but I did not go back and rewatch the, the taping. It's good enough the first time around. So <laughs> with that being said. Um, we should also uh, throw in the reappointment of Dr. Keo. To yeah, accept. that's what I was going to say. We have the, uh, to the Accept and Tech uh, Board of Directors. So Henry, do you want to start us on both of that? Sure, Dover, um, off you please. Do I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? Um, of the approval of the minutes and the reappointment of Dr. Keo to the Accept and Tech Board of Directors as presented in our packet. Do I have a motion? Leslie Leon, so moved. Do I have a second? Mark Healy, second. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll roll call Leslie. Leslie Leon, yes. Mark. Mark Healy, yes. Brooke. Brooke Matteris, yes. Henry Spaulding is a yes. All right, Regent, um, same motion. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Judy Miller, so moved. Thank you, Judy. Is that your second? Lynn Collins, second. Thanks, Lynn. Discussion? All right, hearing none. Michael, vote. Michael Jaffe, yes. Lynn. Lynn Collins, yes. Kate. Kate Potter, yes. Judy. Judy Miller, yes. Maggie. Maggie Sharon, yes. And Ann Hubby, yes. And your cat. <laughs> My cat, sorry. <laughs> okay, so Sherburn, finally. Um, so same motion as, as presented to so the approval of the May 18, 2020 minutes and to reappoint Dr. Keogh to accept and tech board of directors. Do I have a motion? Amanda Brown, so moved. Second. 
Megan Page, second. Is there any discussion? So now, um, Amanda? Amanda Brown, yes. Megan? Megan Page, yes. And Angie Johnson, yes. So we're almost done, but first I want to acknowledge that we have two members that this is their last joint committee meeting um, for all of us, for the Sherber and Dover and joint. And so one of them is not on tonight. So hopefully Rachel Spillman will watch this at a later date, I'm sure with bated breath and hopefully popcorn. So we wanna thank Rachel for her service and for her time and effort and dedication on the committee. And Henry, since you're still here, I don't know if Dr. Keough told you when he talked to you earlier, to leave, you have to recite your favorite poem, sing your favorite song and do a dance. <laughs> Otherwise you have to stay on the committee. Yeah. All joking aside. I'll have to bring out like a, that then. find like the light in the attic in my library and uh, recite one of those. <laughs> so all joking aside, Henry, I have worked with you this year and it has been an absolute pleasure. You are knowledgeable and you're level-headed and you're dedicated and you're always a fantastic sounding board and no matter what silly question I came to you with or what I said, I don't understand, you explained it and you, your kind nature and knowledge was just something that I really enjoyed working with you. So I wanna thank you for being on the committee and for putting in six years and um, you know, coming with a smile and always you know, making sure that everything was well presented, well thought out and we appreciate your dedication and your hard work, so. I would be remiss if I did not say that we're going to miss you a whole lot. So anytime you want to come back, you're welcome. <laughs> and we still have your number. I saw your text. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> we do. We do. Please. Henry, I can't help but think that you must have had an amazing student teacher in ninth grade who really influenced you and made you the adult you are today. All the credit goes to my seventh grade English teacher, actually. <laughs> I'm gonna tell her that. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I'm gonna miss you, Henry. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Uh, I just want to quickly say thank you to all you guys. I mean, what a great um, committee to serve with throughout the year. Um, Anne and Angie, you guys were fantastic to have conversations with as um, the other chair folks of the other two committees. Uh, we've, we've covered a lot this year. Uh, Dr. Keough, Beth, Don, you guys have been fantastic to support, support us. And Cheryl Ingersoll, without a doubt, um, is behind the scenes and always deserves our support and gratitude. And I couldn't have done six years without her, um, two years with getting agendas ready and correcting me where I needed to be corrected. So she deserves a ton of credit. So thank you very much. And um, for everyone that I've served with, it's been fantastic. Next year, guys, keep innovating. Keep supporting the administration and the leadership. And uh, you guys are off to great things. So thank you very much. I'll miss you all. Thank you, Henry. Henry. Thank, you. thank you, Henry. And I want to thank the cameos. Amanda's daughter got to make it, and, and Anne's cat was there ever so briefly. So <laughs> thank you all. So with that being said, we will adjourn tonight's meeting. And I appreciate you all. And have a nice weekend. And we'll see you again.